look at it. They gave me only one bar, only one bar of soap. For one month, try to do your laundry with that. That's what they gave me, one bar. They don't trust me simply because during so many years of collective agriculture, the peasants have been lied to. You see, the land was confiscated from the peasants in the 30s, even in the 20s, 60 years. So the new generation never owned the land. The land has become alien to them. I was told we were getting rid of some bosses here. Shouldn't we then get rid of a few apparatchiks up there in Moscow? We don't want to work for the government anymore because the bureaucrat who approved this project doesn't live in this house. Standing in front of a customer, we are ashamed. Let there be capitalism, a sort of socialist capitalism, but still capitalism. Major funding for this series provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Public Television Viewers, Ford Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, Charles E. Culpepper Foundation, W. Alton Jones Foundation, and the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Corporate funding provided by the Chubb Group of Insurance Companies, for over 100 years providing business and personal insurance through independent agents and brokers in established and emerging global markets. The locker room at Kalinin Mine in the Siberian coal mining town of Prokopyevsk. The miners are getting ready for the afternoon shift. Joseph Stalin once promised these workers a paradise. But today they call it hell. <laughs> The last time I visited Siberia as a New York Times correspondent was in the early 1970s under Brezhnev. Even then, I could see life was grim. But people were still silent. Today, they speak out. You see, we have slavery here. Every slave has three overslaves. Three of them for one of us. In the summer of 1989, 30,000 Siberian coal miners went on strike. 100,000 more in the Ukraine. The first massive strike in Soviet history. Civic rage over the revolution's unkept promises. In 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev came to power, admitting what these workers already knew too well. The Soviet economy was in shambles. He launched his plan to modernize the system by curbing central planners and introducing a touch of capitalism. He called it perestroika, the reconstruction. And he made it a test of his leadership. Five years later, these miners are telling Gorbachev, perestroika doesn't work or there's not enough of it. So I went to find out what went wrong and why. A coal miner named Nikolai has invited me home. He lives in this neighborhood. These houses, made of wood and clay, may look picturesque, but miners loathe them. They have no running water or modern conveniences. 
Nikolai and his mother-in-law welcome me. I prepared for you a pot of good tea, good strong Siberian tea. Nikolai's wife is expecting a baby in a few months. Their house has just one room and a tiny kitchen. In the main room, the only furniture is a bed, which doubles as a couch in the daytime. In Soviet mining towns, the mines are the main source of housing. Around 20 to 25,000 people in the city are on a waiting list. At the current rate of construction, Nikolai would have to wait 20 years for what he wants. Nikolai and his family want to show me the local grocery store. During the strike, the government promised 50 tons of additional meat. But three months later, Nikolai tells me, the local grocery store still has none. There is some fish in the store, but people are buying it to feed their pigs. Any change since the strike, I asked the saleswoman? No, all the same as before. Except lots of flies. The situation with sugar is just as bad. Sugar is rationed, but Nikolai's mother-in-law angrily points out the store doesn't even have any. Other shoppers erupt in fury over shortages of tea chocolate and soap. They gave me only one bar of soap. Try to do your laundry with that for the whole month. Let me take it out. That's what they gave me, one bar. There is no excuse for this, nothing to defend. And we are talking about perestroika. I only defend my people. I only defend my country. You all know we have perestroika and glasnost. Wait a minute. We have freedom of speech. Do we have glasnost or not? Nikolai and the strike committee are convinced the store is hiding choice items in its warehouse. He demands to see it. He accuses the manager of filling the trunks of party big shots. Why does everybody wipe their feet on us? We are not responsible for shortages. So tell me, who is? We are telling you, but you don't believe us. We are telling you something and you twist it around. During the strike, we checked the license plates and found out everything. What did you find out? Did you go to people's houses? Have you found food from this warehouse? A typical blow-up in a typical Soviet food store. Helpless people in a futile argument. The simple truth is, not enough food is available in the entire country. Much rots in the fields or in storage. It is a haunting symptom of decades of agricultural failure. This is the land that hardly feeds its people. Before the revolution, land reform created 17 million private farms in Russia, and the country became the world's leading exporter of grain. Then Stalin nationalized the land and imposed collective agriculture, and the USSR became the world's number one importer of grain. For 25 years, these women have been distributing state-baked bread to the villages near Yaroslavl, 200 miles north of Moscow. Here lived the last farmers of Russia who lost their land to Soviet power. These women are their daughters. The land that remembers, crop seizures of the 20s, Famine of the 30s, Khrushchev's bragging about agriculture in the 60s. 1989, harvest time in the Soviet Union. All the malaise of the state-run agriculture strikes at once. 
20 to 30 percent of the crop never reaches the consumer. When the state finishes its harvest, the people's harvest begins. Years back, it was called stealing from the state. Today, it's a fact of life. This is nobody's. There is no owner. These carrots will be wasted and turned into fertilizer. That's it. This is our whole harvest. We need vegetables badly. We need carrot juice for our child. How can we get it? On the open market, it is expensive. In the store, they sell it only until the end of the year. What kind of harvest is this? This all comes from the land, and we don't know how to use it properly. We seed the crop, grow it, then grind it into the ground. Snow comes and covers it. Where is our perestroika? There would be no harvest in the Soviet Union without these volunteers, because so many people have left the countryside for the city. These young people are the Soviet equivalent of our migrant workers. The difference is that the six weeks they spend at a state farm is part of their curriculum. These are medical students from Yaroslav, known for their diligence in harvesting potatoes. They work here for a man who is a bit of a look-alike for Gorbachev, not only intellectually, but even physically. He is Dmitry Starodubsev. Under Brezhnev, he lost his party membership and went to jail. Then the system did not want innovation, and he got into trouble for being too entrepreneurial. But Gorbachev's reforms have given him another chance. Here at Dzerzhinsky State Farm, he is admired as a good manager and even won election to the Supreme Soviet, beating a party candidate. At this staff meeting, he suggests that the manager responsible for housing be demoted and opens the matter up for discussion. One reason for removing the manager is that it's already mid-October and there's no heat. Also, part of the asbestos insulation on the pipes has been ripped away by the wind. Because the antiquated machinery breaks down so often, Soviet farms must triple their manpower to handle the harvest. Starodubsev gets by with only doubling it. He's good at putting machines back to work. 500 people live and work at Juzinski State Farm, one of Stalin's creations, organized like a factory. The state plows the land, the workers punch the clock. Often, entire families are on the payroll. Housing and most of the food are provided. But the new boss is not happy with the old way of doing things. He wants to turn his state farm, big as a Texas ranch, into a Western-style agro-business. He brought in East German tractors and cut the waste of his potato crop to 10%, but they are still the lowest grade on the market. Starodubsev wants to raise better potatoes and set up a processing plant to make potato chips and other products. He wants to do the same thing with the farm's vast output of meat and milk. But the trick is to get the people to take more initiative themselves. Gorbachev wants to let farmers buy the land back from the state. For communist hardliners, that's too radical. So long-term leasing is the compromise, a half measure. The idea is that they lease the livestock from us. Please, take it, we tell them. 
and we are also offering them the land so they can work on it and grow the cattle food, feed the cows, and sell them to us. Star Dubsov has approached his best people with the idea. He started with a family which has the best results in cattle raising. To lease it means I have to work on this land myself. But if the weather is nasty or something, how will I manage? What if I do not have enough feed for my cows? What if I do not have enough strength? So they want to feed the animals with our feed. They find this more convenient. But isn't this too much of a risk for them? Exactly right. Another example is Orlov, whom I told you about. He is a good professional who knows the machinery and knows how to grow and harvest potatoes. He has a large family. I made him an offer. Comrade Orlov, lease the land and the machinery. We will give you the seeds and fertilizers. Grow potatoes and sell them to us. He tells me, I'll think about it. Then he thought about it and says, no, I won't take it. I asked him why. He says, no rain, no potatoes. And adds, you are paying me a salary, right? I say, right. If I lease from you and there is no rain, I would still have to work. But who will pay me? I have a loss and then there will be nothing to eat. With all this talk in the Soviet Union about land leasing, are you ready to take the land? No, I'm not ready yet. I don't have the right head for it. I'm not educated enough. It's easy to take it, but you have to take good care of it. It would be nice to be a farmer. Everything would be clean around here with no junk machinery. What conditions are the most important for you to make it profitable? What conditions? Conditions which will help me grow more and to sell for more money. All sorts of contracts are needed. To lease or not to lease has become the Orlov family dilemma. But now look, they may say, we don't want you to grow beets here, we need potatoes. But we know that beets are more profitable for us. Then they might say, if you don't want, that's okay, we'll take our land back. So what kind of lease will it be? I am just waiting for his retirement in two more years. I can't wait until he enjoys himself sitting on the sofa next to me. We have already been on the waiting list for a car for five years. My father is not able to buy a car. A hero worker with no car. And he cannot buy a car. If the machinery and everything is ours, then I'll call it a real lease. It means we plow, harvest, and seed the ground, and then we sell our crop. People who lease the land need some assurances. Since we would have to set our own prices, what if the state farm refuses to buy potatoes at those prices? You see, in your country, you know how to do it. So maybe we should first visit you and see how you handle it. Well, in your country you have all kinds of farmers. They buy the land and become their own bosses. It should also be like that here, but we don't know yet how to go about it. The next morning I asked Dara Dubsev why the farm workers don't trust him. They don't trust me simply because during so many years of collective agriculture, the peasants have been lied to. As a result, they developed a general distrust, which they now direct toward me. But I tell them, take it, please. We'll help you. We'll create proper working conditions for you. Take it. They are afraid. Today we have Stadadupsev, they say, and what if someone else will replace him tomorrow? 
Today, Gorbachev is in charge of the country. Tomorrow, Gorbachev may disappear, and the attitude towards leasing may change, and we will be broke. Uh, in other words, our people do not believe in tomorrow. As someone who was sent to prison, you yourself, do you now believe in the system? All my life I believed that one day there would be democracy in our country and that it would be based on deeds, not on slogans. That laws would be made not against, but for the people. I believe such times have arrived. Especially as an elected official, I have this feeling. I'll fight for laws promoting truth and trust among people. I want this word, gentleman, to be established in our country, too. So when a man gives his word to someone, it becomes an unwritten law. You see, the land was confiscated from the peasants in the 30s, even in the 20s, 60 years. So the new generation never owned the land. The land has become alien to them. The livestock he's willing to take, to breed the animals, that's okay. But the land, he's afraid of it. Our people have lost feeling for the land. Agriculture has always been a neglected stepchild of this economy. But heavy industry was always a Soviet pride. And throwing up massive plants far from Moscow became a trademark of Soviet socialism. The goal was to surpass the world in steel, oil, machine building. Here in Sverdlovs, 2,000 miles east of Moscow, a gigantic plant for heavy machinery was built from scratch in 1933. They called it Uralmarsh the Ural machine building plant, an industrial legend celebrated in poems and songs. Industry built at the expense of the consumer. This was a perfect example of the Stalinist model of command-driven economy and a tool of Soviet propaganda. People prepared to sacrifice for the might of their state. When Uralmash rolled out Soviet tanks for World War II, this crowd cheered. After the war, the Soviets stuck with this way of producing. But it was too rigid. It stifled innovation, and the world passed it by. Today, Uralmash faces hard times. 50,000 workers strong, it is a kind of General Motors of Russia. It epitomizes the Soviet economic crisis. The era of the hero worker is long gone. These workers are no longer willing to sacrifice for the state. Uralmash is bleeding. Nearly 5,000 people, 10% of its workforce, have left in the past year or so. The new Soviet workers are looking for greener pastures. This man wants them back. He is Igor Stroganov, general director of Uralmash. I came here to see how a captain of Soviet industry is coping with the times. A few years back, Prime Minister Nikolai Rishkov, supreme boss of the Soviet economy, sat in this same chair. Like Rishkov, Stroganov started as a worker at Uromash, went to night school to become a welding specialist and after ideological training became Uromash Communist Party secretary on the way to the director's chair. This is the man with the mandate to bring Perestroika to Uromash. For decades, industrial managers like Stroganov were puppets of central planners. Now, Gorbachev tells them, be your own boss, keep your profits, do your own investments. He promises them freedom and insists make your plant efficient. It is a mighty assignment. Uralmash virtually monopolizes the manufacture of most essential heavy machinery in the USSR. Giant mining excavators, oil drilling equipment, turbines, presses for iron and steel. 
most of these products are unprofitable for Uralmar. If Stroganov could do perestroika his way, he would give up these items. He would rather make more small machines and sell them abroad for dollars, yen, and marks, hard currency. But central planners still make him produce too many big excavators and sell them at home for rubles, claiming that other Soviet industries would collapse without them. That's his Catch-22. In the beginning, we were given full independence in foreign trade. We thought the gates were wide open, and we happily entered. And then it turned out the gates were blocked with a huge dam. We are not a small firm with 100, 150 employees. We are not a seedy enterprise, but a serious business with a huge inventory and customers in 42 countries. Our turnover is so big that we deserve to be trusted and be given special worldwide trade permission. At least 75% of our hard currency from foreign trade should be left with us. Perestroika at Uralmaj. Stroganov wants to use his new managerial freedom to give his workers more incentives, increase their productivity, introduce profit sharing. Our situation with tools is tragic. One half of all drills are not there. All over the plant, Stroganov's economists try to make a good case for Perestroika. But there are many more questions than answers. I was told we were getting rid of some bosses here. Shouldn't we then get rid of a few apparatchiks up there in Moscow? There are too many of them. The workers raise all sorts of dilemmas. What kind of self-management is it when the prices are still fixed by the state? Why do they still need a central administration if each shop is supposed to become independent? How can we catch up with the West? What are we talking about, catching up with them? When we're 200 years behind, and we sit and wait. Our bosses sit in their butts, doing nothing. So perestroika is not working the way it should. There's still a crisis at the end of every month. Stroganov has to resort to old methods, running around like a cheerleader, mobilizing workers to fulfill state quotas. Deliveries run late, output stacks up. This is what we call unfinished production. The less time this stuff lies around here and the quicker it is delivered to the customer, the more profit for us. What are your main problems, I asked Stroganov. We have billions of problems. First, a shortage of manpower. But look, this is the second shift. He now has only enough workers to man 40% of the available machine tools. The third shift has even fewer workers, right? That's right. 10% of our machinery does not run full capacity because there are no orders from customers. About 60% of the machinery cannot be used because of a shortage of qualified workers. The rest of the machinery works normally. In your country, normal economic relations exist, meaning you have money. The free market exists. You purchase your raw materials, any kind of resources, and you solve any kind of problems. We, on the other hand, in the era of perestroika, have to learn your lessons and, so to speak, establish a new mechanism of economic relation. Because now, even if I have necessary means for the development of the enterprise, I am not free to make decisions because of the old mechanism of control. I cannot freely buy my supplies myself without state control. One way or another, the state decides 95% of Stroganov's output. To produce what he wants, he needs raw materials, but only the state has them. So he has to produce what the state wants. Catch-22 again, and since nobody can get rich on the state's fixed prices, Uralmash stagnates, and its workers leave.
Ulamash was called the father of Soviet machine building. Like a good father, it provided half a city of subsidized housing for its workers. The father, once praised, is now being blamed. Stroganov, the father figure, visits one of 12,000 Uromash families living in substandard conditions. These two parents and their two children live in one dorm-like room. They share the kitchen and bathrooms with other families. They have been awaiting a separate apartment since 1981. Their number on the Uromash waiting list is 2,944. Three more years of waiting if everything goes well. What is your dream for living conditions, I ask them. Just a normal apartment, they say. Two rooms, one for us, one for the kids. This family intends to stick with Uromash, but a steady stream is quitting. Of the workers who leave, 12% cite low wages, 20% bad working conditions, and 40% inadequate housing. At the personnel department, those who conduct exit interviews call themselves lifesavers for Uromash. Please terminate my employment at Uromash because of a position I plan to accept elsewhere. The supervisor is against letting you go and urges the personnel department to negotiate a pay raise with you. How long have you been with us? Five years. All these years at Oral Mash? Yes, but in different shops. Married? Yes. Children? One. Living conditions? One bedroom apartment. Satisfactory housing? Yes. Provided by Oral Mash? Yes, by Oral Mash. Have you got a new job yet? Yes, I go to work for a private enterprise. Private enterprise. Do you think the private enterprise movement will survive? Wait a minute. You shouldn't put the question that way. Are you going to have a very flexible work schedule at the new job or not very flexible? Well, there, it all depends on my productivity. The more I do, the more I make. So that means it is very flexible. Well, it looks like the factory lost another worker. To stem the departure of his workers, Stroganov wants to use some of his profits to build new housing for them. But in the Soviet system, money is not enough to build a building. Regional authorities control all the resources, manpower, equipment, bricks and mortar. They must approve every big construction request. Stroganov learns from his construction manager that one half of his 30 million ruble building request has been turned down. He tries his party connections to reverse the decision. Tomorrow is the deadline for appeals. His contact is not there. He's gone out. There is no logic in their action. All our problems today are related to the low level of social services for our workers. Housing and the provision of cultural services. I can understand the reduction of our industrial construction in the light of recent economic decisions. 
But to deny our request for housing makes no sense at all. A manager of Soviet industry trapped in a squeeze between government control and his workers' demands. Let's not play with words. Shortening the working time, it is a strike. An old smokestack industry crying for reconstruction. What to do with this aging, muscle-bound giant? Where to squeeze? Where to expand? The Japanese offered a $100 million loan to modernize this old shop and go into partnership. But Moscow refused to put up matching money. Stroganov did not have his own dollars or yen, and he had to let the deal slip through his fingers. With a heavy-handed state still shackling industrial managers like Stroganov, Gorbachev has invited new players into the economic game, private entrepreneurs. But so that it does not sound too capitalistic, the Soviets call these enterprises cooperatives. The construction business is where cooperatives flourish. Soviet people have been crying for a decent place to live since the beginning of socialism. These faceless structures are considered a luxury in Moscow. Mark Masarsky lives here. He is one of Gorbachev's new players, and he wants a revolution in housing. All this housing complex may have different forms of ownership, but it basically belongs to the government. This is my apartment, but I don't own it. It belongs to the state. However, this is my own wife. Her name is Ola. This is my little son, Yannick. Of course, he thinks this is his home. But I don't consider this home as our own. We didn't pay for this apartment, and I want to buy my house. That's how the concept, own your own home, came to my mind. This West European one-family housing design served as a model for my program. This is not the first time Masarsky tried to make capitalism live side by side with socialism. During the Khrushchev era, he belonged to an experimental group which collectively operated a Siberian gold mine. That experiment died under Brezhnev. Perestroika has given Masarsky a new opportunity. When the government announced that up to 40% of all Soviet construction could be built privately, Masarsky asked for a 1 million ruble state loan and purchased this dilapidated brick factory on the outskirts of Novogorod near Leningrad. Four years ago, barbed wire fenced this brick factory. Prisoners worked here. 350 of them used to produce about 12 million bricks a year. With new equipment, Masarsky has nearly doubled production with just 90 workers. With these bricks, he wants to build his dream houses. Lured by what Russians call the big ruble, workers came from all over to join Masarsky's cooperative. They make 1,000 rubles a month, five times what the state would pay them. Leaving their families behind, they accepted former prison cells as temporary quarters. Masarsky promised them homes of their own soon. For appetizers, a health club built in the gutted maximum security section of the jail. It's a showcase of the cooperative's income, which is quadrupled in only two years, reaching 16 million rubles in 1989. Many Soviets attack the idea of private industry as exploitation and speculation. So I asked Masarsky about the risks of operating in a communist state. The idea is that we combine an employer and an employee as a shareholder. We do not have a policy of hiring people. That's the first risk. Second, we create a free market inside an economy without a market. We are private businessmen, but everybody around us is restricted by state orders. 
The third risk is the social and political one. Some people do not believe in perestroika. But for me, it's the only chance. After this, I will not have another chance. I am 49, and this is my swan song. Three years ago, no co-ops existed. But Gorbachev passed a co-op law, and now there are more than 5 million people in the growing private sector, with total turnover of more than 40 billion rubles a year but still a small portion of the whole economy. Altogether, Masarsky has 800 workers. Each of them has a share in the business. Some build highways, some build houses, some make bricks. He calls his enterprise socialist capitalism, and he likes to quote Lenin, who tried cooperatives in the 1920s and who said that socialism is a society of civilized cooperators. Masarsky considers it civilized that his salary is only two and a half times the pay of a worker. At this meeting of the co-op, Masarsky is giving his workers advice on what to do with their extra money. Housing prices will go up, so anybody who owns a house or apartment makes a good investment. Masarsky sounds like a market analyst, yet he operates in a country where there is no market. Bricks are in short supply, so he uses them to barter for equipment and supplies. But no one has enough lumber for him. All the lumber in Novgorod is under the thumb of this man, Alexander Bohan, state supervisor of timber. Masarsky once leased one of Bohan's lumber mills, but the state demanded almost all the output and left no lumber for his dream houses. So he gave up the lumber mill. Now he's back trying to cut a better deal, a partnership. At the moment, we are limited by the state orders. There is no solution for his situation. They will fire me if I do not fulfill the state plan. I have no other way except of doing what I am told to do. In order to give him lumber, I would have to produce more. But I do not have either human or technological resources. So I push Bohan, suggesting that since there is perestroika, maybe he can ask Moscow for more flexibility. But he laughs. Everything is possible if they untie my hands. So it's not possible here? You are right. So far, it is impossible. In the quantities he needs, it is impossible. Yes, I have a big appetite for wood. This is the lumber mill they have been talking about. Bohan complains about his lack of resources, but Masarsky used to have 100 men at work here. Since he turned it back to Bohan and the state, production has almost stopped. The state is a monopolist, not capable of taking advantage of its wealth, because nobody wants to work for them. We have workers. Combining his resources and my skills, we could have a treasure here. Leasing is not a solution. We should own this business. This lumber should find its way to a marketplace. Owned by the state, it lays dormant. It belongs to everybody and nobody. The state and I, we are like two fighters. His feet are stable, he stands firmly on the ground, he has resources, but his hands are tied. I can do with my hands whatever I want, but I stand only on one leg. But I need two. One is brick, one is lumber. With only one, I cannot make it. So without lumber, the road to Masarsky's dream of building private homes is nothing but bumpy. Yes, he builds houses, but at the state's orders, at the state's fixed prices, and using inferior materials supplied by the state. Yuri Kaplan is Masarsky's chief engineer. Construction elements are soaking wet and soggy. We have nothing to cover them with. The roofing material never comes on time. Windows made of raw green wood eventually dry and warp. It's hard to put in the glass. It takes a lot of effort to make the window right. It takes lots of manual labor. 
Typical of Soviet housing, these houses were paid for by the Ministry of Irrigation, which rents them cheaply to its local workers. These are brand new houses, but there's a hitch. Masarsky's builders can only rough finish them. The shortage of finishing materials is so severe that even a powerful ministry cannot obtain them for its own project. The solution? Give the new occupant a token sum and let him finish the job. The ceilings are a disaster. When you walk in the attic, you feel them wobble. As for painting, before we could do it properly, my wife and I had to smooth the walls by gluing newspapers on them. How about the floor? Well, the floor doesn't seem very sturdy either. Unfortunately, I can't open the basement now to show you. The floors aren't steady. Fungus is growing under them in the basement. It's very wet there. How long will this house last? I don't know. We won't build these houses anymore. We refuse to continue working on this kind of project, although it seems very easy to do. It's made of prefab sections. A year ago, we were tempted by the simplicity of this design, but then we realized, look, he's not my customer. I never met him before. My customer is the state. The state ordered this house. The state approved it, and the state is pleased. We could have continued this arrangement with the state, but we don't want to work for the government anymore. Standing in front of a customer, we are ashamed, because the bureaucrat who approved this project doesn't live in this house. Do you think you could build better houses, let's say, for him directly? If he pays me, of course. And how much would it cost? Whatever the actual cost will be. According to the contract, nobody is happy with this. I'm not happy, the renter's not happy, I'm not happy. And I'm saying the state should not be happy, but he corrects me. I say the state is happy, all right. They've decided that before the year 2000, each of their workers gets an apartment or a house. So here, 10 families got housing. But the state doesn't care whether the families are happy or not. They made a check, filled the square. He lived in one room with a family of three. He didn't have any choice. He was given this house and he took it. So we have to change the customer. It should not be the state but an individual homeowner, a paying customer. Why shouldn't the state give him a mortgage, let's say for 50 years? Let there be capitalism, a sort of socialist capitalism, but still capitalism. So I went to the Kremlin to see how much capitalism is possible. The man I will see is Deputy Prime Minister Leonid Abalkin, Gorbachev's chief economic advisor. He's a learned scholar, but like all his economist colleagues, he's never met a payroll. I tell a Balkan about all the complaints we have heard from people who want to make the economy work more efficiently. I ask him why they can't have more freedom. What's the obstacle? The major problem of perestroika is that there are some people who want perestroika and there are some people who combat perestroika or want to keep things the old way. And the powers are almost equal. Today, one side is getting the upper hand, tomorrow the other side. So we call perestroika a revolution. It's a revolutionary fight. It's like a fight of two powers. It's not so simple. A Balkan has scheduled a meeting with his advisors. They let us listen to their debate about the pace of reform. We see very limited time for changes. Also, we have to consider the experience of small socialist countries. Why repeat what they have already lived through? They've been doing economic reform slowly. In Hungary, it took 20 years. In Yugoslavia, 30 years. In Poland, 10 years. Now, for example, the Yugoslavs brought to their parliament a new accelerated concept of reform showing why slow pace had failed. 
It is impossible to provide all economic spheres with the same opportunities at the same time. We must ensure the stability of large enterprises which need to solve their internal problems. But in finances, which is the blood circulation of the entire economy, we need a more radical approach. In short, a Balkan's advisors see the country in crisis. One proposes launching major new steps in 1991. But the others, worried about public impatience, are pushing a Balkan to go for bold measures much sooner. I've just heard your young economists saying that you have to take large steps forward at once, not go slowly. Are you going to do that? Well, maybe because I am older than them, I suppose that we should make these steps cautiously. When I enter an unknown territory and when I take my first steps, I first have to make one step, feel the solid ground under my feet, and only after I am sure that I won't slip into the swamp, then I'll take my second step. When my foot feels the solid ground again, I should make my third step. We are living now in a highly charged social situation. We have no right to make a mistake. Our society won't tolerate a government which makes such mistakes. Have mistakes not already been made? Well, I have to make efforts, and that's my role here. That's why I was transferred from science to the government, so there will be no more mistakes. You can provoke social unrest and strikes by some careless actions. Social disturbances don't come out of a void. They may be the result of ill-conceived decisions. There is a movement going on. The market deteriorates, the economy goes downhill. So the first thing we must do is to slow down the reform so the economy will not slide further. After we stop, then maybe we should not climb up the hill immediately, but after a while. What specifically do you want to stop? To stop the worsening of the economic situation in the country, to stop the budget deficit, to stop the imbalance in the consumer market. That's what must be stopped, the economic downturn. Will this message play out here in Siberia, where the miners want to see the fruits of their strike and a payoff from five years of Gorbachev? This is the kind of place where sparks fly. I meet with the miners around the statue of Lenin at the Kalinin mine in Prokopyevsk. There is talk of another strike to make the government deliver, of taking over local control of the mines. One way or another, we want to be owners of the coal mines. Let's say in the form of shareholding. We would hire the management and set aside a certain percentage of the profits for the administration. The rest of the profit will be distributed among us. Nothing will change if we do not get rid of the supremacy of the Communist Party. But who is the party? You and I, we are the party. Let's make sure the right people run the party, and things will change. No, they won't. All the party wants is our dues, nothing else. Not true. It wants your voice. But we don't have a voice yet. It's only been four years since we began to speak. Four years is nothing. In America, 200 years after the revolution, they still have big problems to solve. In America, a capitalist closes down the mine when it's not profitable, right? But isn't it true that after 10 years of working underground, an American miner can support his family for the rest of his life? Isn't that true? Here, he's been working for 23 years. I've been working for 16 years. Come to our apartment. There is nothing there. Nothing but illnesses, broken bones, and scars all over my body. All talk, no results, they say. I heard that refrain on my travels from Siberia to Moscow. 
I saw a few bright spots, a bit of private enterprise, a handful of daring industrial managers and farmers, but all this lost in a sea of troubles, shortages, inflation. Perestroika is choking. The economy was the reason for Gorbachev's rise to power. It will be the ultimate test of his success. So far, he has tried only half measures, shying away from radical reforms. He seems afraid that bolder steps will cause unemployment, factories shutting down, or food riots and a popular backlash. But unless he is more daring, he will not be able to lift his country out of its economic crisis. Is he still too wedded to the old system? Has the complexity of perestroika outgrown its creator? Or is it simply that nobody has yet found the path from a centralized to a market economy and completed the journey? This is Hedrick Smith. In our next program, Nationalities, can Gorbachev hold the Soviet state together against nationalist tensions in Central Asia, the Caucasus, and the Baltics? <laughs>